persistent phosphorus and uh, their limitations. Okay. Thank you, Chairman, and uh, thank you for the organizers to give me the opportunity to present uh, our work here, which was uh, performed at uh, Ghent uh, University. Okay, so yesterday we already heard that uh, strontium aluminate is a very important persistent uh, phosphor. It means that after you stop the excitation, it can emit light for a very long time. If you look here at the time scale, it can be of the order of hours, which led to major uh, applications and uh, mainly in emergency uh, signage. Now, what's so specific about these persistent phosphors is that essentially it's a normal photoluminescent material. Typically, it's uh, uh, europium-2 plus is the luminescent ion. Normally, after absorption, we quickly have the return to the ground state within, let's say, a microsecond. Now, in some cases, we can optimize a number of defects in the crystal, which form electron traps. And then the electron can, after excitation, can move to the, to the traps. And depending on the, on the trap depth, it can stay there for quite some time. It can be of the orders of seconds, up to days. And then, by some triggering, it can move out of the trap, leading to recombination and then yielding emission. This can be thermally, this can be mechanically, this can also be uh, optically. As such, we can think of a persistent phosphor as an optical battery. We can charge it by illuminating with high-energy photons, UV light, and then at some point it will be able to emit light at a somewhat lower energy. Now if you make a back-of-the-envelope calculation, you find out that you typically have a storage capacity of about 2,000 millijoules per gram, which may seem a lot, but it's about 200 times less than an uh, alkaline battery. So we can store some energy in this material, but not too much. Now, if you want to realize applications, um, for instance, if you want to make glow-in-the-dark road marks, which emit light the entire night, you need a lot of storage capacity. And if you calculate, you will see uh, that it drops too soon below a good intensity level. So we need to increase our storage capacity. Also for other applications. Many of these persistent phosphors are also mechanoluminescent. If you apply pressure, you trigger the release of the trapped electrons and you have light emission. You can use it as a stress sensor. Here you have the same material and we apply ultrasound to it. Ultrasound pressure field can give you light emission. So there are many applications, but in all these applications we need storage capacity. We need to put a lot of energy into these uh, materials. We try to change synthesis conditions, but we do not get at uh, a sufficient capacity for many applications. So where is the bottleneck? You could think that it's due to the fact that you cannot fill these traps. But this experiment shows it's a blue persistent phosphor. You switch on the UV light and you look at the material. And initially, it's not emitting any light. It's only when you start to fill up the traps that light becomes uh, or gets emitted again. So the trapping um, probability is very high. If you do an excitation on a phosphor with empty traps, you can say, well, it goes to the trap. So the probability for trapping is very high, yet we have the fact that the storage capacity is not so high. We want to understand this. So what the approach we've chosen is to model everything, to model both the trapping electrons going to the traps as the detrapping at the same time. And therefore we devised a specific experiment. So what you typically do when you look at a persistent phosphorus, you excite it with a high energy uh, photon source, you switch off the light and you measure the output. Essentially that's what's, what's seen here in the emission intensity. It can take a long time, so often you perform a thermal luminescence measurement to empty the remaining traps, which is shown here. You increase the temperature. What's often uh, overlooked is that while you apply the excitation source, if you look at the light output of the material, there's a lot you can learn. And this is what's shown here. So the fact that the intensity increases in a specific shape also gives you valuable information. 
If you can perform all these experiments at different temperatures, it's possible to probe thermal barriers for trapping, thermal barriers for de-trapping. Okay. So I said we were going to uh, model these effects. So we take a model where we have uh, our luminescent centers, europium ions, and locally we have some traps available. And then we have a probability after we excite it that the electron goes to a trap. Similarly, if an electron is in the trap, it has a certain probability to go back to the ionized europium center and then yield you the emission. So that's our simple model. You can write down the rate equations. They are uh, not too complicated. It's a fairly simple model. You have uh, excitation rate, you have radiative probability, non-radiative, you have trapping and you have detrapping. If you solve this, what we exactly get is not so important in this case, but if you put in the right boundary conditions, you start with what is the initial situation, no traps are being filled. You make some assumptions on the excitation intensity, then you typically get this um, profile. You get two um, eigenvalues out of it, you get an initial jump, and then you have what we call the charging, so the intensity increases. If you switch off the excitation power, you have an initial drop, and then you have the emptying, the slow emptying of the traps. So this is the, the solution you get uh, out of it. It's very uh, comparable to uh, charging a capacitor, for instance. Okay, now what is what we get? In this presentation, I will focus on this material. So not our famous strontium aluminate. We take this material because it has only one side for the europium ion. So that makes it slightly um, easier. So if we look at what's, what's uh, going on, we see this initial jump. But we see that the drop, if we switch off the, the light, is much higher. We also see that the curvature we have here is strongly different from the curvature we have here. Whereas in our model, these two curvatures are essentially the same. So it doesn't work with our uh, model. Okay, so that does not work. Also, if we change the excitation intensity, so we excite with the UV LED, we, get, we give different powers. So you will see if you increase the power that more light is being emitted, because essentially this is photoluminescence. You see, difficult to see that this increases a little bit, but also here you see an increase in the thermoluminescence uh, peak. Now, if you take a look at the curvature of these um, charging uh, curves, then they should be all the same. Because in your rate equations and the solutions you get, you get the same curvature. You cannot change it. And here you see that you get a different curvature. So that's a problem. And we have a third problem with our, uh, the behavior of our phosphor material. If you start to excite the europium ions and electrons are being trapped, then you will reduce the number of europium 2 plus ions. So if you then excite with UV light, you will expect that the absorption will decrease because you have less europium 2 plus ions available. Here we look at the intensity of the reflected excitation light. And you see that the reflection is going down, which means that the absorption of UV light is increasing, whereas you have less europium 2 plus ions available if you move on to these curves. So we have a problem. And this curvature becomes more important if you increase the excitation uh, intensity. So how can we get around? Well, let's assume that we have something which is very known in storage phosphors, that you can also optically empty these traps, which is then called optically stimulated luminescence. In many cases, there's a difference between the light you use to fill the traps and the light you use to empty the traps again. Different, often it's a different wavelength. But suppose this happens at the same wavelength, so that our excitation light is also able to empty this trap, and afterwards you can have a um, recombination. This trap, this trapped electron, can have an absorption section which is higher than the europium 2 plus ion. We make it variable, so we, here we introduce an absorption uh, cross-section relative to the europium uh, ions. So we introduce this into our model and we see where we uh, get. So it's just adding two terms in the uh, rate equation. 
The full lines are our experimental values. The dotted lines are our um, fitted values. If we take this optically stimulated detrapping into account. And you see that for many temperatures with the same parameter, we can easily fit everything. You see that the charging curve here is nicely reproduced. The drop here is much higher than the increase we have here. So it, it, our difficulties are more or less uh, solved. If we look at the influence of the excitation intensity, you also see that the curvature is changing as a function of the excitation intensity, which again nicely fits our work. Now that's based on, let's say, um, some peripheral observations. Can we prove directly that we have optically stimulated deep trap? So we take our phosphor material, we heat it so that all our traps are empty, we put it at a fixed temperature, we illuminate it with UV light, we cool it to low temperature, and then we start our thermoluminescence measurement to see how many traps were filled. This is what comes out. As a curve, you can integrate this area, and we call this 100%. Then repeat, we repeat the same experiment. So we empty all the traps. Now we do not excite at zero degrees, but we excite at minus 60 degrees. There's a lot of photoluminescence. The material is giving a lot of light. If we now record our thermoluminescence intensity, and we integrate everything, then the intensity is of the order of 1% of the other experiment. So we do not manage at low temperature to fill the traps because there's a thermal barrier to go into the traps. At minus 60 degrees, you cannot go into the traps. Interesting thing is if we combine the two excitations. So we empty, we illuminate both at zero degrees and then afterwards also at 60 de minus 60 degrees, we perform the thermoluminescence and we have lost 40% of our trap charges. So if we excite at low temperature, then we are emptying our traps. So it shows that making use of this thermal barrier, that the excitation light not only fills the traps, but also empties them. And if you do this at room temperature, then both processes are constantly occurring, and this will limit the amount of energy you can store in the traps. Finally, what we did was changing the color of the second excitation at low temperature, from blue to green to yellow. And if you then do a lot of normalization and calculations, then you can see this is the response you have at low temperature for the optically stimulated d trap. And then you see a few surprising things. So this is the normal uh, PL emission and excitation. It largely overlaps. So in the UV, you have a lot of optically stimulated d trapping, but also at longer wavelengths. You, green light is also able to empty the traps, and even red light is able to empty the traps. So this is very worrying, because you want to optimize the trapping, but on the other hand, you have mechanisms emptying uh, it. So this optically stimulated luminescence can explain quite a lot of aspects of the charging and decharging behavior of our persistent phosphors. This is very worrying for applications, because on the one hand, you can optimize the amount of traps, so that there are many traps where you can store energy, but while you are filling them, you are also emptying these traps, so you do not reach the full charging capacity. It's like with an old laptop computer. Um, but on the other hand, if we better understand this process, then there might be ways to make other traps with other spectral sensitivities so that we can increase the trapping uh, capacity. Maybe one final thing. Recently, we had, following uh, another conference, a special issue published on uh, persistent phosphors, and there you can find uh, many interesting uh, papers in Optical Materials uh, Express. Finally, I would like to thank uh, the funding agency, all the collaborators, and especially Jonas, Katrin, and Claude, who are the main contributors to this particular work. And I thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions, please? Yes, please. Okay, so I would like to ask you a general question because, first of all, do you have some idea about the nature of your traps? Because when you, uh, you deal with uh, times of uh, days of weeks, what kind of traps are you dealing with? On the other hand, I have a general question concerning why in this kind of materials uh, 
this persistent phosphorescence is observed because in other cases, no. So in, what is the reason? And, and also, what, uh, why do you need to have both European and dysprosion at the same time? Could you comment on about it? Thank you very much. Um, what we've noticed is based on, on uh, X-ray absorption measurements that the parts of the electrons are uh, uh, indeed trapped at the code open, at the dysprosia, or samarium in other cases. And it's very similar to certain storage phosphors. But for persistent luminescence, the trap depth should be, it's a very subtle value. If the trap is a few tenths of EV shallower, there's no visible trapping. If it's deeper, then the light will not go out. So it's a really uh, very subtle play. But there are also other defects, which are typically considered as being uh, oxygen vacancies, but also cation vacancies are possible. So that's still something I have to uh, uh, agree with what uh, Rob Jackson said yesterday, that we need to study these type of defects, and especially in the light of those performance. Thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, we have no time for additional questions.